National Head in my name forward today. I'd also like to thank all the teachers at Sunrose that got me to where I am today. Thanks to them, I've been able to work on some really fun stuff since leaving here. From designing the biggest aircraft in the world, to designing new technology from the McLaren Formula 1 racing team. In fact, in my time at McLaren, I was lucky enough to have my stuff tested by a talented but unknown 17-year-old called Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> now, even then, what I always dreamt of is going to NASA and building spacecraft. And ever since finishing my PhD, that's what I've been doing. Now, I found that working at NASA brings some strange responsibilities. Everywhere I go in the world, people first want to know about the conspiracy theories. Uh, you know, the fake moon landings, where we're hiding Elvis, and things like that. Uh, in fact, a friend of mine from primary school popped up after 20 years out of touch on Facebook and sent me the following message. Lars, I hear you work for NASA now. Is it okay if I ask you a few questions? Number one, do aliens exist? Number two, is global warming real? And number three, is the world going to end in 2012? <laughs> he goes on to say, I don't think the Mayans could have predicted that we would get hit by an asteroid in 2012, but I would love to get the inside story if possible. <laughs> now, I was really tempted to say that I wasn't supposed to tell you this, but the world is going to end next year. <laughs> um, and I've actually got one more space on the rocket ship if you want to come with us. <laughs> of course I did. And I can tell you now that even though this is just my personal opinion, the world is not going to end in 2012. Global warming is real and the moon landings definitely did happen. But as to the, exist as to the existence of aliens, answering that question is one of the main reasons that NASA, and in particular my lab, the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, has been going to space for the last 50 years. And even though we do spend a lot of our time going to Mars, we're not necessarily looking for little green men. In fact, we're not even looking for life that exists today. We're looking for life that could have existed millions of years ago, or the potential to support it. And we're looking for the potential for future life, in particular, water. Everything on Earth needs water to live. So we go to Mars with orbiters, landers, and rovers, and we search for the water. But landing on Mars is hard. Since the start of the space program, out of 38 attempts, only half have been successful. The fundamental reason is that landing on Mars is a very difficult science and engineering problem to solve. Out of the five-year mission, landing takes only six minutes, but is by far the most risky phase. We call this the six minutes of terror. And at the beginning of those six minutes, the spacecraft sends a signal back to Earth saying, I'm going in. But because it's so far away, even at the speed of light, by the time that signal reaches Earth, it's already happened. Either the spacecraft landed safely on Mars, or it died trying. The moment that I saw the engineers in that control room go crazy when they got the signal back saying that we are safely down on Mars, that was the moment that I knew I wanted to work for the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now, in the past four years at NASA, I have been inventing a method for precision landing on Mars. Until now, to land on Mars, we've had to find somewhere that's flat and smooth for hundreds of kilometers. Imagine coming to explore Earth for the first time. From orbit, you would see lakes, rivers, mountains, and even cities. But if you could only land in the desert, then you'd miss out on most of the good stuff. With my technology, we can now land on something the size of a football pitch. We can now go to the places on Mars where life is most likely to have existed. My technology will be used in a few years on the first of the Mars sample return missions, which for the first time will bring a rock back from the surface of Mars to Earth. Not only is that hugely exciting for science, it's also a crucial stepping stone on the way to human exploration of Mars. One of the reasons that we send robots to Mars is that we don't have to bring them back. For a human mission to Mars, we'd better figure that bit out. <laughs> now, it was here at Stemlokes that I learned the power of science and technology. Partly, that's because Stemlokes taught me the maths and physics that I use every day in designing spacecraft. 
Partly, that's because the Electronics Labs gave me the free reign to design projects of my own, including one that gave me about 10 seconds of television fame for being the best young electronic designer in the country. But the real reason that I discovered the power of science and technology here is something that I called the Housemaster Detector. <laughs> now, I used to be at Johnson's, uh, and this all happened before uh, Mr. Smith was housemaster. Uh, and in the fourth year, my dorm was the only one that wouldn't get busted for playing music, having lights out, and generally causing havoc after lights out. The reason was the housemaster detector, and this is a true story. What I'd done is I'd put a pressure pad underneath the carpet, just outside the door, so that when the housemaster walked down the corridor, he would step on the pressure pad, the box of electronics would turn everything off inside, and everything would go dark and quiet, he would peer his head in slowly, and then go and bust somebody else. <laughs> This worked for so long, so well, that eventually the carpet settled around the shape of that pressure pad, until we thought for sure one of the teachers must notice, but they, they never did. Um, the system did eventually fail though, uh, when one of the boys decided to plug his electric guitar into that box of electronics and play it as loudly as he could in the, in the middle of the night. Um, but as with all technology, you can never entirely protect against human error. <laughs> So, getting back to space, what's the future for space exploration? In the next 10 years, as well as sending robots to the outer planets, NASA is also addressing some of the most important problems back here on Earth, including climate change. I work on a climate change mission called SMAP, which will orbit the Earth to predict droughts and floods in the short term, and to improve climate change models in the long term. But for the next generation, Space travel is going to be very different. A handful of small private companies, such as one called SpaceX, are going to take over from the government in running the space shuttle when it retires later this month, and will make the cost of going to space a tiny fraction of what it is now. If they succeed, eventually going to a different planet will be no more difficult than going to a different continent. In fact, the boss of SpaceX sees this as insurance for our species, and that if we don't do this, it's just a matter of time before nature, or our own stupidity, wipes us out for good. For you at Seven Oaks, the future is very exciting. I want you to know that science gives you the power to do what you otherwise couldn't, and to understand what you otherwise wouldn't. Whether you want to go to Mars, or whether you want to work out if your house master's coming down the hall, Science can let you do it. Science can overcome political boundaries with objective facts, and if you're into this kind of thing, of my friends that have become millionaires before the age of 30, every single one studies science, maths, or engineering at the university. It is amazing how much you can do with the concepts you learn right here at Sevenoaks if you understand how to use them and you have enough imagination. Now, I've got just about time for one more story, uh, and I'd like to finish with a cautionary tale for those who, like me, are thinking of becoming astronauts one day. And that is, what is the difference between a rock band's tour bus and the International Space Station? Now, I share a house in Los Angeles with a friend who plays in a rock band called the Airborne Toxic Event. Uh, and they recently went on a national tour of the US uh, that went on for a few months. When he came back, he told me that the one golden rule that he learned that you never break in that tour bus is that even though there is a toilet in that bus, you never, ever sit down on the loo and um, go number two in that bus. The reason is that the smell stays with that bus for the entire six-month tour. And that got me thinking, what about the International Space Station? The International Space Station is sealed airtight you stay there for months on end, you can't open the window, and you certainly can't stop at a petrol station to use the um, facilities. So I texted a friend of mine this simple question, he's uh, applying to be an astronaut, and uh, I said, what does it smell like on the International Space Station? And the answer came back in a text message with one single word. <laughs> and that's what I've got time for, thank you.